from the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're Inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution for global growth for more than 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism right here, right now, at the NYSE and at ICE's 12 exchanges and seven clearinghouses around the world. Now here's your host, Josh King, Head of Communications at Intercontinental Exchange. Welcome back Inside the Ice House. Conversations around technology, privacy, and data has dominated the recent news cycle, including Mark Zuckerberg's recently completed two days of testimony before Congress. We could not have asked to have a better guest here in the library to talk about these topics and how data will continue to be the driving force behind the modern world. Our guest today, my old friend Mark Penn, introduced the term soccer mom in the 1990s and a decade ago wrote the seminal text of how technology was and would continue to fragment society. In 2007, he published Microtrends, to identify and describe 75 small groups that were exerting an oversized impact on the direction of society. He's now followed up that with Microtrends Squared, the new small forces driving the big disruptions today to continue his exploration of how 1% of the American public can create massive social change capable of changing the commercial, political, and social landscapes. My conversation with Mark right after this. Inside the Ice House is presented this week by ICE Global Index System, or GIS. ICE's index families combine leading reference data, evaluated pricing and analytics, along with a track record in index provisioning spanning 50 years to deliver unique, cross-asset and best-in-class index solutions. Mark Penn has been exploring the trends of business, politics and society for decades. In 2015, he formed the Stagwell Group, an investment company that focuses on advertising research, data analytics, public relations, and digital marketing strategies. Mark previously served as a political advisor and strategist for both President and Hillary Clinton, as well as British Prime Minister Tony Blair. He and I first became acquainted when we both worked in the Clinton White House, where Penn and Schoen, a global market research firm that he founded with his Harvard roommate, was brought in to introduce the innovative polling techniques he developed working on the political campaigns and for NYSE listed companies such as AT&T, Ford, Merck, Verizon, McDonald's, and others. Welcome, Mark, back to the NYSE. Great to be talking to you again. Uh, Let's start with this book. It, like Microtrends, really is an investment book, if you want to look at it this way. I mean, you, you might expect Mark Penn to be writing a political tract, but this is a book where people can really trade on some of the data inside. Well, uh, the book is really intended to be for people who want to find themselves in how society is changing, people who run businesses, people who want to found businesses. Uh, last time, I, I, I always remember the story of a chapter I had called Sun Haters, where parents tell kids now not to go out and get sun, but to go out and not get sun. So the, the business owner wrote me and said, you know, I'm going to retool my entire clothing line, and and so I'm going to going to make my clothing line sun protective. And so there are business ideas, but there are also core investment ideas because, after all, the best investments are with the trends. And my fa- one of my favorite chapters, and it is actually the pro proteiners, where I discovered that chicken consumption in the U.S. went from 20 pounds per person to 90 pounds per person. I immediately went out and bought some stock in chicken companies and Chinese chicken companies, and I did quite well. I mean, you should spend a a minute or so, Mark, describing the organization of the book. Six sections, section one, love and relationships, section two, health and diet, section three, technology, section four, lifestyle, section five, politics, section six, work and business. And within those six sections, these identifying labels that you described that are so vintage Mark Penn. How did you go about designing the outline of this book and then coming up with these wonderful, and I think in many ways, thrilling labels for these groups? Well, I really wanted to cover 
50 representative microtrends. You know, I, I think there could be hundreds of microtrends, but you need to be a microtrend hunter to really find the changes that are small but significant. You know, I liken them to 1% of the population. You remember I say 1%. If you look at militant dreamers, they're one of the biggest political forces in, in the country. Uh, if you look, the last election was decided by probably the old economy voters, those people who kind of lost their jobs in the old economy, who, who voted together to defeat Silicon Valley. I mean, I see in these trends the forces and counter forces that are shaping society across culture and politics and business and technology. And I spent some time setting the book and say, look, there are some big changes happening. There are some things that are quite different from 10 years ago. I think in this book, I'm, I'm much more pessimistic than I was in the first book. I, I, I have more caution or amber uh, lights up. And, and particularly after you see what Facebook is going through, I think actually the public is beginning to see some of the amber in technology. But you can also always short pessimism. That's an investment thesis as well. Well, one of the chapters is called Happy Pessimists because the American public has never been more economically enthusiastic really in the last two decades than they are now, nor more down on their government at the same time, which of course we've never seen before. Usually attitudes towards the government correspond to economic attitudes. So technology is still something I believe has an incredibly bright future. I'm very pro-technology. I try to point out in the book those things I think you know, that are, that are maybe not gonna do us well. I'm a little down on driverless cars. And I'm really uh, puzzled that, that people do not have businesses that really extend the human senses yet. That's where I would be, you know, in technology, investing tremendous sums. This book is like a week-long cocktail conversation starter. And I would just sort of duck into a little bit for each section before we get into the rest of our conversation. But I want to pluck out some of the titles of these sections because they are so vintage pen. But... In section one, in love and relationships, number two is the never marrieds. And you begin with a description of Jimmy Stewart's character in It's a Wonderful Life and whether he would uh, have a terrible life if he never married. But your data suggests that's really an emerging microtrend. Well, that's right. I mean, I suggest that the whole image that Jimmy Stewart was shown in that movie is something that wouldn't be shown in negative light today. You know, actually, as we, we find in the book, there's a, a, a larger group of people, you know, uh, who are who are going to be in the never married category, which really didn't didn't exist before. And these are people typically more dedicated to, to their career and, and in some cases themselves than, than, than people ever were before, uh, especially after I think people spend so many years alone uh, after college, which they never had before. Some of the data that you have in the book, Mark, if you look back at when Microtrends first was published, 2005, 16% U.S. adults, 36 to 35, who've never married. Today, 22%. Not only are people getting married less, not only do you have to have housing for never married, a tax code that's fair to never married, you, you, you know, people who, who aren't married, do they, do they get pets? Typically, I have another chapter called SWP, Single with Pet. Because if you don't have children, people say, hey, I want to have a pet to take care of. And, and that's really been a great, a great trend for the pet industry. In section two, it focuses on lifestyle. One of the sections is the speed eaters. You have a wonderful anecdote, Mark. And th for those who don't know you well, you spent so much time with Bill Gates, the chairman of Microsoft, both in the 90s and, and later on when you went to work for Microsoft. And I'm going to quote from the book, when I worked with Bill Gates, he would eat right through a meeting, never stopping for lunch. At precisely 12 p.m., a hand would come through the door holding a white bag for Mr. Gates. In it were two McDonald's quarter pounders and a large fries, his daily choice for years. He sounds like Donald Trump. Well, I was, I was really so astounded <laughs> that here you have the world's richest guy at that time. He's probably number two now. And what he really wanted for lunch was McDonald's. And his staff had to scurry around. And he was very efficient. Uh, he, he later on went to some really greasy Chinese food. So I'm sure today he eats very, very healthfully. But, but I think the chapter points out that, that, you know, the lunch hour is gone. I mean, you know, look, when I originally had my very first summer job at NBC, people came in in New York City to 30 Rockefeller Center, 
10 to 12, they worked. 12 to 2, they were out. They had a few, uh, shall I say, imbibed some alcohol during that period. And I'm not sure a lot of work got to. Today, people work straight through. Businesses provide food on premises. People minimize eating time, which also, you know, can have social impacts. Uh, I think so anything like that. And then foods, you know, obviously the fastest single food is just a protein bar. What's the investment thesis there? I mean, I find myself to the extent that I'm a speed eater too, walking down the sidewalk, pret a manger, walk in, get a quick baguette with something and almost eat it walking down the sidewalk. Is that is there sort of a prepared food investment thesis that this works for? People want healthy, nutritious consumption without spending time. It's really quite incredible. I mean, we're, we're losing it. So I think there's continued investment opportunities. I, I do think that, that, that when you look at them, the, the kind of uptick we've seen in delivery, uh, I, I think from a business point of view, too, I think, I think people just get a lot more productivity during the day out of workers than they ever got. Section three, and you won't mind me sharing with our listeners that I've always regarded you as a technology geek. Is that fair? Well, it would be fair that, uh, you know, when, when Doug and I started Penchone, uh, I built a computer and a kit before there was a PC, programmed in an assembler, and had overnight polling. We were the first outside the network. So you could say that I always had a keen interest. And, and I share some of that interest with you. And one of the things that sort of jumped off the page for me was uh, Chapter 19, Droning On. I'm the proud owner of a DJI Phantom 3. I probably should upgrade to the 4 and the 5. But what are you seeing about the development of unmanned aerial vehicles as a trend, as a micro-trend? So, so I picked out a few developing areas uh, in the book for, for special focus. What I found most interesting about drones is right now there's a, there's a, there's a conflict between the security threats of drones and the, the capabilities that drones offer. So right now we have what's called the line of sight rule in the U.S., which I don't think most people know. Uh, which is that you really can't operate a drone that you can't see. So that means all of the things that you read about, like Amazon's going to deliver things, until the site or <laughs> line of sight rule is listed, none of that's possible. But right now, we do not have the sufficient security protocols to deal with the problems that they can be used to invade your property, to invade your privacy, and, and, and frankly, to be used as a weapon too easily, which is why they're banned through the entire Washington area. And New York City as well. So uh, in section four, lifestyle, I was so deeply conflicted about what I would spend my precious minutes with Mark Penn talking about. Do I quiz you about uptown stoners, which fascinates me, or should I ask you about armchair preppers? <laughs> I think I'll, I'll veer toward the preppers. Uh, interesting, because a lot of people ask me about the uptown stoners, the developing marketplace, which I think people have to focus on the uptown, really where the uptown or high-end marketplace, because I think that's where all the money is going to be, the spas of the restaurants, with an industry that's maybe $7 billion compared to compared to uh, the liquor industry that's $200 billion. So, uh, and Josh knows me that, like, hey, I don't have a lot of practical experience uh, in that industry, so it's funny that people ask me to really expound on that. But knowing Josh, he has preferred the armchair preppers because he's worried about what could happen and I think what we find is that so many people are worried about what could happen that, you know, having a, a, a luxury go bag, you know, is now a, that, a great industry. That's like, exactly what I was going to go to because I'm a, I'm a, I watch The Walking Dead religiously. I've got an upstate place. I will never need it, Mark Penn, but I go onto Amazon and you buy these massive kits of first aid and, and go bag prep, all, all sort of pre-made for you. And... I don't think I'll ever crack the zipper of it, but just having it gives me a sense of satisfaction. Well, and not only that, but every couple of years, you've got to refresh it, right? It's like a fire extinguisher. People want, people want to be prepared. And when I say armchair preppers, this used to be something that, you know, people kind of on the fringes of societies did to the extreme. There are a lot of things you can find now. Real, you know, you can buy real estate plots where you can put in your shelter and you can be isolated and you can be off the grid for the time when the machines destroy the rest of the world. Or you could just buy a few luxury items so that you feel a lot better in the event catastrophe happens. Section five, Mark, politics, obviously... Uh, your sweet spot and the area in which you've helped to elect presidents, prime ministers, brought in all around the world to help manage elections, create advertisements. One of the toughest 
fights you were ever in, obviously the 2008 campaign advising Secretary Hillary Clinton in her primary run against Senator Barack Obama. And I need to sort of veer toward the, the impressionable elites uh, revisited and get you to sort of give your spiel about the idea that people who think they're really smart are actually the ones that can be most easily swayed by what they hear and how they convince themselves that they're right about everything. Yeah, well, this this is really my favorite trend in the last book and my favorite trend in this book because it is it is such a problematic trend. So I really the, this started when I, when I observed that when people come up to me when I was working for Hillary Clinton, they would come up to me and they would say, you know, if Hillary were just a little more likable, I'd vote for her. And increasingly I saw, well, those were like the PhDs, really educated, well-off, wealthy people would invariably say that. And then if somebody came up to me and said, you know, if her health care plan would really do more about cost rather than coverage, that would be something that would interest me, middle-class voter. Now, in theory, the way we think about the world and the way American democracy is set up, well-educated elites are supposed to understand the details of issues. The rest of the public, right, the, 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 is not supposed to understand the issues or care about them as much to be easily swayed by non-issues. What's happened is our elites have gotten so well off, so removed from the everyday problems, they don't buy health care. They don't experience the problems. They actually become quite movable on the basis of what they see in elite publications or talking points on TV. In fact, I ran Burson Marsteller, uh, which was 2,500 people dedicated really to swaying elites. None of them tried to sway the general public. And so it turns out, it turns out now that things have gotten upside down. And both whether they, they were cared more about likability than issues uh, with candidates or now believe Russia collusion. They were, you know, if you look at set down with PhDs and, and whatnot and say, well, do you have any evidence for this Russia collusion? Well, it just is. I mean, it's money laundering. I mean, they're just, it's quite obvious. So, so this almost this sense that elites follow what they see other elites saying is incredibly dangerous because our whole society and democracy is set up for the elites to be the rational ones, right? And, and it turns out that, that the, the middle class voters today have more education, have the access to the internet, can read more, and have more in-depth both experience and understanding with the issues. Go figure. So in the first little part of our conversation, Mark, we've dive very briefly into five or six of the micro of the micro trends that are part of micro trends squared listeners who are hearing our conversation should pick up micro trends squared and get mark's much more detailed explanation of 50 of these and it is such a th quick and thrilling ride uh do you have fun writing this book compared to the first one uh i did i mean i i did all I mean, the you are pes more pessimistic but <laughs> Well, because I, 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 you know, these books are written when you've got something to say. And so, as you know, in the end, I've got a lot of policy prescriptions about how we fix what's gone wrong with technology. Uh, and so there, in the beginning, I kind of lay out the problems, but but I, I, I enjoyed it. I, I worked with Meredith Feynman and I had a, a researcher, Amelia Showwater. And, you know, uh, frankly, as you know, Josh, I'm, I'm a slightly older fellow. Uh, and, and they were also brought a fresh millennial perspective yeah. and so that we could really bring those perspectives together to be, to be fresh and current. The challenges of technology, Mark, we are living through it really in real time right now. You've been writing extensively over the last few days on Facebook since the Cambridge Analytica story broke. Yesterday you published an op-ed in the New York Times it was titled, How to Make Facebook More Accountable. Before you explain your solution to how to make them more accountable. What did you see as the problem that, they, that needs to be solved? Well, I, I, I understand that really everyone's focused on the privacy issue. And, and I think that is a very important issue. But I think even more important at the moment to me is, are these huge platforms platforms or are they media companies? And uh, if they're unwilling to choose, we really have to be careful about the power that they have gained. If you take a look at, at Facebook, for example, two thirds of the population spends an average of a half hour on Facebook a day. That means that they are bigger in broadcasting capability 
than hundreds of radio and TV stations. Radio and TV stations that for many, many years were regulated so that there wouldn't be too much concentration of ownership because that means that only one perspective tends to dominate. So now you have Facebook hiring 20,000 people to basically be censors on all this content and to run news flows where they decide what people see first. And when you put impressionable elites together with an organization like Facebook, not with real editors now determining journalistic priorities, that is a, a potentially uh, toxic combination for our democracy. You mentioned a little while ago that you might be slightly older than the millennials who helped you put this book together. So some of our listeners might not recall the 1990s when you were working with Microsoft chairman and founder Bill Gates on preparing for his testimony in the antitrust trial against Microsoft. But if you were a political advisor working today brought in uh, to Facebook's Washington office and talking to the team advising Mark Zuckerberg of how to comport himself in front of the House and Senate this week, how would you rate his performance and, and what would you give him as guideposts for what to say at this point? Well, first, let me say uh, that when in the same couple of days you see Stormy Daniels be at the top of the news flow with congressional testimony of Mark Zuckerberg, and in the 90s we had Monica Lewinsky and the congressional testimony of Bill Gates, the irony of history repeating itself in all of these ways is not lost on me. Uh, you know, I, I thought, look, I thought his testimony, I saw a lot of it yesterday. I, did, uh, I thought his testimony went pretty well. He was calm. He was collected. Uh, he, he uh, frankly, he, he didn't get pushed into too many corners. Uh, he basically said when he did that, hey, I'll get back to you on it. Uh, I thought the uh, the level of questioning was was was. I mean, I I think a lot of the questions were prepared by staff, and they didn't really understand the questions they were asking because they got so easily pushed off of what they were asking. It was incredible to me. It it highlighted how you know the problem we've got with 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 Congress and technology, so that probably everybody there understood that they should label political ads, but I'm not sure they understood they understood much else. I mean, there are really a couple of exceptions. I thought Kamala Harris's. Uh, questioning was pretty sharp. He said, well, you agreed to these things in 2009, and then you come here today basically pretending like you didn't, like these were all new problems that, that hadn't occurred before. So I think he did a good job, very different from what we did with Bill Gates. We were fundamentally and, and more defensive. We, we basically said, look, we're here because of the tremendous innovations. We don't think that it, it necessarily lasts. Other innovators will will come along. And so our position was to rebut the various things people were thinking. Uh, and, and the Facebook positioning was, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So it was radically different. I mean, he, he, he came off pretty well. I think it's a dangerous strategy in the sense that if you're a plaintiff's lawyer and you have 20 admissions that, hey, we didn't do these things and almost every person on the, our platform has been scraped without their knowledge, contravening the 2009 requirement of disclosure. Wow, I, I think there, there's a potential feast there. The focus this week has been on Zuckerberg and Facebook, but how has machine learning and algorithmic targeting across the internet, it's being deployed in a much wider way than just at Facebook. You write a lot about it in the book. Are these technologies designed to just increase clicks and engagement? And what's the cost of that? Well, uh, in the book, I'm, I'm really concerned about the lack of disclosure uh, and how damaging that could be. First, first people somehow believe that they're, they're so magical uh, that they could, you know, that a year from now they'll be driving all our cars. And I, I throw a lot of cold water on that in the book. Uh, but, but the basic trend that happens that I think we have to be worried about is something like this. Uh, you have an app, and the app says, hey, Josh, it's going to rain today, so when you go into work, maybe wear your raincoat. Very helpful, sets up helpful to you, doing a great job. You know what? It's pretty expensive to keep telling Josh it's going to rain. Somebody at the central office comes up. You know, maybe we'll tell Josh where he can buy an umbrella. So then it's, Josh, it's going to rain, 
And by the way, around the corner on your way, you can buy an umbrella. Well, that's not so bad. We're still kind of helping Josh. If you look at it, for example, Google, Google Maps tells you how to get an Uber. It's a very similar tie-in. Time goes on and somebody says, you know what? We're just not making enough money. Wall Street wants higher earnings. How do we get that? Somebody says, you know what? Uh, let's just tell Josh, instead of that algorithm being set at 50% that it's going to rain, let's just move it to 40, 35. He's got, not going to notice. But to be safe, he'll probably buy some more umbrellas or ponchos or whatever it is we're selling for his rain thing. And so at that point, the app is no longer working for you. It's working to sell umbrellas. But you don't know that. To you, it looks exactly the same. And I think the, the lack of disclosure really then encourages this hidden process to go on as people monetize things that you thought were working for you and that were previously free. The answer to that isn't so much to stop it as to be really clear, I think, in the disclosure. And this moves over to AI. I, I always say about Alexa, uh, is Alexa a he or a she? We don't know. Well, you have been, you have been a better responder than most because most people say, oh, it's a she. Well, Alexa is an it, okay? And, and ethically, the minute people think it's not an it, that diverges from the fundamental principle that it's just a bunch of code. And it's a code that you don't know what it's programmed to do or to sell you. And so you, you also have to know, know that. And uh, we've got to get a handle uh, on, you know, I know engineers look up close for years as chief strategy officer at, Mic at Microsoft, and they do an amazing job. But they're far removed from the ethical dilemmas that often come from their work. And that's what you saw with Zuckerberg. He was far removed from what could happen 10 years later with something that he designed to do so much good. Uh, you've got a section in the book called Kids on Meds. Uh, you dedicate the book to your three kids. They've been raised during this era, Mark, progressively as more and more digital opportunities are available to them. How do you balance your love and embrace of technology with the importance of human connection and the, the pressure that parents often face to say, you know, does my kid have ADHD and is this at all related to the march of technology? Well, uh, one of my little children has now grown up and is a psychiatrist. So she argued with me a lot about this chapter. Uh, this chapter shows the tremendous increase uh, in medication going to kids basically for ADHD. Uh, and as I recall, something like 3% to now almost 15% of, of children are diagnosed with this and 80% or, or, or so receive medication. And so we don't know the impact of all this early medication. Now, she argues with me, look, it's the information age. People have to sit through more school than they ever have. And the diagnosis of these cases, primarily boys, Right, become very important in letting them get the tools that they need to succeed in school today. So she'll say, hey, don't worry about it. This is a good thing. The chapter tries to stay neutral and say, I don't know if it's a good thing or not. Part of this is that we extended health care benefits. More and more people on the lower end of the spectrum it used to be just rich kids got meds. More and more went to doctors, got these prescriptions, and the jury then is out. Is this is this helping kids perform in the information age who otherwise would drop out of school? Or is this going to create a lifelong dependency that will lead to the opioid crisis getting even worse? I don't know. My point in this microtrend is just to flag it and say we ought to watch it. The New York Stock Exchange's president, Tom Farley, often points to the statistics that global, global poverty is down 80% over the course of his lifetime. He's not an, he's He's a younger guy. At the same time, there's an increasing economic anxiety, particularly in this country, around the loss of manufacturing and manual labor jobs to automation, combined with what's seen as a decline in the middle class. This is one of the many dualities that your book looks into. Uh, how do you seemingly square the disparate worldviews between the march of technology and the downsides that it brings? Well, I, that's a great question. I, I think that first, uh, which I hadn't realized when when I stopped working uh, with uh, you know President Clinton at the end of his second term, we had kept manufacturing jobs pretty stable. So after that, over the next two presidents, manufacturing jobs basically fell almost in half because 
I think the economic policies and the changes in the world so favored the coast that we neglected to fully invest in the interior of the country. And that was a huge mistake. And those voters, they, vo those voters got up and, and voted their, their economic, more than anxiety, their, the fact that they had been treated as, as I think, second class, uh, I, I think was behind their votes. Now, on the other end, the usual, hey, automation is going to create, cost all these jobs. You know, I am I am actually more optimistic that there are going to be plenty of jobs. We have a record number of people employed now. Manufacturing jobs as jobs were, in my view, overrated. When I ask parents, do you want your children working in a factory, 94% of Americans say no. We have a lot of new service industry jobs. Service industry has gone from 40% to 56% of the economy. With I think that the opening up both of personal service jobs, which I have a, another full chapter on, uh, right, and just service jobs, you know, whether you're at Amazon, technically in an Amazon warehouse, you're in a service job. It doesn't count as manufacturing, but it's the same kind of job. And there are so many more jobs now for the, for the better educated. So I, I think that, remember, college graduate unemployment is about 2% or below. So, so we need every college graduate we can get. And I, I think for non-college graduates, the expansion of the service industries and you know some of these new economy-like jobs, people talk about Uber jobs. I've been fascinated recently, we have an extreme shortage of truck drivers in this country, right? <laughs> we are short you can't find people to take those jobs. You cannot find people to take those jobs. And they say, well, there are no jobs for, for people with, with you know, a high school degree. You know, this is a solid job. It's, it's been the core uh, of... Uh, of the American working class, and you can't even find the people to take them now. So, so I'm much more optimistic that there will be more than enough jobs here. One of the theses that you introduced in Microtrends Squared is a take on Newton's third law. Uh, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Well, I, I think that the, uh, well, the Newtonian law of trends to me is that for every trend, there is a counter trend, and that's why the the cover of the book is actually Newton's Cradle, but it's in an impossi physically impossible position. Uh, and But they don't have to be, in the law of trends, they don't have to be opposite and equal. Uh, so, so for all the people who love technology, uh, there, there are more people now, there's been a surge in people buying flip phones, right? So as I always say on the train, there's the quiet car. It doesn't mean that it's going to be equal, but it means that if you're a marketer, and you see the trend is super crowded, think about the counter trend, because that's what makes it so difficult to figure out what's happening in America, because it looks like chaos. It's not chaos, right? It, it, it's people who really love, you know, as you, as you say, you know, uh, it, w people who love steak on the one hand and people who love sushi on the, on the other, and it doesn't mean there's something wrong with that. It's that the natural state of the world is that there's trends and counter trends, and people tend to react to the fact when they see people in a trend, they say, I don't want to be part of that group. And they deliberately move to being in the opposite end of the spectrum. So I think from a business perspective, it's, it's incredibly important. And it's why so many old line businesses, you know, if you visit private equity firms who buy old line businesses, the people think are out of business and they say, no, <laughs> they, think, they think, you know, they, you know whether, it's, whether it's an ADT type business or other, <clears throat> these things are still absolutely uh, going for the very reason that for every trend, there's a counter trend. Is there any personal counter trend for Mark Penn? Are you still a lover of sushi? Uh, I am still a lover of, of sushi. Uh, <laughs> I try to be as counterintuitive as, uh, as possible uh, in, in my trends. Um, you know, I, I, I do think the big, you know, I should say that one of the things I, I point out in the book is like, we're in the age of information. And so, of course, the counter trend is we're in the age of misinformation, right? We're in the age of so much power with the millennials. And at the same time, there are more nanogenarians than ever. And it's the seniors. Really voted. We're in the age of Silicon Valley. And it is the old economy voters who won the election. So the battle between trends and counter trends is, is critically important. Uh, I uh, personally, you know, I, I find... You know, in many ways, I'm always a very counter trend, you know, politically. I was yeah. always in the center. Uh, I remain in the center. I think the Democratic Party, a lot of it has moved to the left. 
Uh, I, I didn't like independent councils all the way back to 1973. I didn't like them under Clinton, and I don't like them today. You don't so, much. You don't put much stock in the idea that the Russians cost Hillary Clinton the election. Uh, I don't because when when you look at it, uh, when you look at it, I think there was a clear set of issues geared towards people from Indiana through Pennsylvania who are old economy voters that Trump managed to hit and hit successfully. And if you ask almost any kid, well, what did Trump stand for? They could tell you it was anti-immigration. He was anti-crime. He was, you know, pro, you know, let's get a, a more tra a, a trade balance. He was about the old economy. They can tell you all these things, and they couldn't quite tell you exactly what Hillary stood for. She didn't, because what Hillary stood for was Donald Trump's unacceptable. And the swing voters here didn't like Trump or Hillary. And so they voted on the basis of, so I think there's a, a very clear thesis that fits the facts. It fits the way each campaign <laughs> was run. The monetary difference here between the campaigns, Hillary had an extra $500 million. Uh, and, and so what, whatever effort there was, it really seems to have been to create more uh, divisiveness. But the truth of the matter is none of the messages run by these <laughs> Russian bots aren't messages you couldn't find on any cable channel at any minute. There was nothing unique about them. Uh, and, and so, no, I, I, I think that we, we've managed to be divisive on our own. Uh, and and I think that the election was decided because of forces that you can you can clearly see and the impressionable elites were so bought into the New York Times 93 7 that they don't see what the rest of America looks like a map of America will show you that something like 90 percent of the territory voted Trump and and that to people who live in New York and LA and why it just seems it just seems inexplicable what I always say about a lifetime in polling is you don't need polls to see that the to see the things you know. You need polls to see the things you don't know. And I don't think enough people really acknowledge that there's so much that they don't know about how Americans live, how they speak, how they act, and how they interact. How do the impressionable elites need to adjust their mindset for 2020 to see things that they don't see now? Well, look... I start with getting a dose of, of the reality in front of them. You know, when when I when this early political season started uh, and Donald Trump was running for president, I said, oh, you know, that guy's a kook. He's not going to get 30 percent. He's not going to get 40 percent. Then I was in the he'll never, ever get over 50 percent. Now, I was proven wrong at that point. Well, OK, there must be something here. What have I missed? Who are the voters? Right? The reality is, and he is right, he won. <laughs> right? And he won against 17 candidates. He must have had something to say. He didn't have any magic pixie dust that I know of. There's no Cambridge Analytica voodoo that can, that can turn people's minds that way, the way people imagine. At that point, I take seriously you know, what he stood for, what are his issues. I mean, the impressionable elites have to understand that when there's a disconnect, between what they think and what clear reality is, that clear reality is right. And you have to reset your thinking based on that. And, and I, don't think, I don't think you see that happening at all. After the break, we talk with Mark Penn more about resetting our thinking after this. GIS provides access to top-level and constituent data for the complete universes of IS, BAML, Bond Index, and Convertible Index families. GIS has extensive functionality that allows you to view and download current and historical performance data and statistics. With the customization tools on the site, you can analyze relative value of individual bonds, sectors, and indices. Visit the ice.com slash indices for more information. Back now with Mark Penn, founder and president of Stagwell Group and author of Microtrends Squared. You describe, Mark, that data is the biggest commodity of the modern world, something that ICE's founder, Jeff Sprecher, also said on one of our podcasts recently, is the commoditization of information and ideas a renewable and inexhaustible resource? And if so, what are the pitfalls that our listeners need to be aware of? Well, I say in the book, look, data is the new oil. Uh, it, it, it's, it's uh, if you think about it, what do I have of, of my great grandmother? Like maybe one little picture. So I don't have much data, but, but today people have a data set 
that begins at birth, begins, frankly, before birth, when they're monitored in the womb, starts with like, do, are they, are they, you know, what kind of pampers do they, do they like, and moves its way through their entire life. In fact, a typical person now is a data machine. They are creating data about their habits, their likes, their wants, and they're being captured primarily through their smartphone, but through a lot of other, other things. And so this data stream, why is it the new oil? Okay, because if I run a company today and I want to sell something to Josh King, the more I know about Josh King's likes, the more efficient I can be in marketing to him. Josh is no longer found on one of three channels at any given time. So marketing there was pretty easy. Well, I just market on a sports show or a different, a different show. Now, Josh's time is broken up in all these different, different habits. He doesn't have all that much time. I've got to catch him. And I want to catch him with something that is maximally relevant to him. So the person who can more often do that because they know their customers is then going to have a lower cost curve than the company that doesn't know their customers very well and so therefore doesn't maximize their revenue against those customers because they don't have the most intelligent data-based marketing. They will go out of business. It is a matter of time. So every company has to think this way. And if they haven't done it, they've had a successful business model until now, they have to get ready for the data-oriented business model or they will be defeated and beaten by someone else in their industry who has it. But with the proliferation of data, Mark, uh, what steps need to be taken to protect an individual's information? And does that action need to come from government, corporations, or is it your own personal responsibility? Well, I, I am less worried about, uh, about data privacy than I am that people should get a fair share and understanding of how and to what extent they're being monetized. So, for example, I, I, people have no idea, and, and uh, uh, I don't think anybody asked Facebook, like, so what's a typical customer worth? What do, you, what do you get out of me? I mean, I get a free service, and wow, you, you sell 100, 200 bucks? Maybe I'm a really good, good maybe I'm a good, uh, more upscale customer. So, so maybe you get three or $400 of advertising out of me, right? But you never tell me that doesn't look to me that you're collecting 400 bucks for my data, right? So I, I think people should, should know that, right? And then they should have more control over that. Well, do I want to sell it to all these brands? Do I want to have kind of a, more of a fence uh, around it? Do I, do I want to just uh, pay for my Facebook 10 bucks a month and rather than give them $400 worth of ads? Now, Facebook and others wouldn't like it if the choice was in my hands. Right now, I think the problem with the data model to me isn't that it's wrong, it's that it's hidden and undisclosed. You know, there are no free apps, <laughs> there are no free services, uh, there, there's, there's no free anything in the technology world, at least not for long. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that what happens is, for example, people don't know that even their text messages, if they're, if they're on one of the, the typical mail services, are read and analyzed and as part and then become part of how they're advertised. So I want more disclosure, I want more control for consumers, and I want more understanding of how much I'm being monetized so that whether or not I care about that becomes based on an informed decision. Uh, and, and right now consumers don't have even the slightest bit of information to make informed decision about their data. Putting on your hat as president of Stagwell Group, would you advise your clients uh, as they're thinking about their strategies to connect with customers in an efficient way to use services and platforms like Facebook? Of course. I mean, I, I think that, that Facebook gets a tremendous amount of people's time. You know, as I always say, first there was TV, then there was TV advertising. First there was Facebook, then there was Facebook advertising. And so Facebook, look, search advertising, Facebook advertising, uh, you know, they're both very effective. Uh, people who, who are actually also, you know, creating apps and things have to advertise. But people, brands cannot count on capturing as much time of people's time uh, on television anymore. So because people have moved from the TV screen 
to the small screen, they have to be there with their advertising and their marketing. And they have to be there efficiently because you can't buy, you don't buy 20 million people at once. You buy a selection of people who are more likely to buy your products. And so you have to understand how to do that. That's why really the Stagwell Group came into existence as a digital first fund where we would collect a group of digital marketers and bring it to scale because it's a whole new industry when you think about it. <clears throat> the major digital platforms are 10, 12 years old. Digital marketing really wasn't very important to companies until four or five years ago. And it's important, you know, right now, in internet advertising is overtaking television and mobile advertising is on the verge of overtaking desktop. So that's where people are. That's where they spend their time. That's where you need to figure out how to market to them. Your resume goes back to working on campaigns for Bella Abzug and Ed Koch up through the Clintons in the 90s, uh, Tony Blair after that, and then back to Penn Schoen and Burland taking over, Burst and Marsteller, part of the WPP group, and then the period that you spent at Microsoft. I want to, as we move into the second part of our conversation, talk about your decision to leave sort of the the commercial research and public relations side of the business and go into work for Microsoft and why you made that decision and what you learned when you were out at Redmond? Well, I think, uh, again, uh, it's great, great subject to reflect upon. Uh, I always had kind of twin interests of technology and politics and issues. And, you know, I approach politics from an egghead point of view, which is, right, <clears throat> you could find I issues, you could find words. I wasn't a street organizer. I was more of a word and policy organizer because those were the tools that I could really influence through through polling. And so, uh, you know, I, I got the incredibly rare opportunity to work not officially in the White House, but I was, I was frankly there almost every day and had a meeting with the president uh, and the top staff once a week, <clears throat> which to bring the White House together and talk about, not just where they are in the polls, but what they could do policy-wise, what they could do communication-wise. And I got to do that for six years, and that was an incredible experience, uh, helping the president both make the best decisions he could and then get through some unexpected crises, like impeachment, uh, and which seems like a dim memory to people uh, uh, now. and. And so having started in polling, having worked my way to politics to get to be kind of a pollster and advisor uh, uh, to the president, you know, we then took our company and we became part of WPP. I wanted to manage something something bigger, and then I managed Burson Marstell and put into effect the strategies that would, that would turn it around uh, uh, for five years. And then I said to myself, well, okay, I'm actually came up with the idea that I probably was going to create Stagwell, probably create a group, an investment-based group of digital companies, probably now, you know, work a lot more with capital. It's very interesting. People ask me, well, what do I know now that I didn't know in my 20s? <laughs> uh, I would say in my 20s and 30s, I drove personal services to the very best I could to get to work for people like Gates and and Clinton and so forth. And, and now in these these later years, I'm kind of working more with capital and understanding how we can build and invest through that, how we can create jobs with capital uh, on a much bigger scale, much faster than I could, and build on the experience that I had <clears throat> as a pollster. Then I was head of Burson Marsteller, a big PR company. And then, then at Microsoft, I said to myself, well, look, they were, since 98, my largest, my largest client, before I embarked on something like this, I'd really like to know, do I understand technology as it is today? And uh, I wrote Steve Bobmer and said, you know, I'd be interested in, in coming over if you'd let me try to whack away at some of your most difficult problems. And uh, he basically said, sure. Although I had like a seven hour job interview with him once. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I kind of made the switch to really make sure I was current. And at the same time, I, I, I felt that I could help them bring the, you know, larger world. And uh, after a short period of time of working on some of the problems, he said, you know what, I, I like your, your stuff. And he made me head of advertising. So I had a $2 billion budget and we went to the Super Bowl. 
and uh, we revamped all their advertising. I had done a Scroogled campaign, which was the first campaign ever, uh, ever on digital privacy, really, uh, questioning uh, whether people knew uh, about how their privacy was being used. Because, you know, if consumers don't know, you can't compete on privacy. If you don't know how your data is used, you can't be the other company that treats it differently. So it was it, it got unbelievable consumer response. I was second only to Xbox in terms of fans. Uh, every day, 250,000 people would come uh, to the privacy website that we had erected. And uh, as a lark, one day as a lark, I created Scroogel merchandise. I had only like 10 mugs. 450,000 people came in the first two days. Uh, it was astounding. So so. We really, we really tapped in, in, into something. Uh, and so, uh, so I, I really enjoyed, because I wanted to get some insight. So it's one thing to be a consultant to all these companies. It's another thing to really be inside. So Steve made me part of the management team. Uh, we had 12 executives, and we'd meet uh, every Friday for either half day or full day <clears throat> to really see, I think, both, you know, obviously my role then uh, was advertising, and then when Sacha uh, took over. He made me chief strategy officer, so I really helped, you know, direct the overall strategy and review the various areas where where I thought the company should invest should invest for the future. And so this gave me kind of fascinating insight, and that's where I kind of understand how engineers work. How you know, I, I used to have a a running joke at Microsoft if somebody would come in and they would come in and kind of base their technological ideas on what well, something they saw their kids or their or their spouse doing. And I would say, you can't do that when you have a billion customers. <laughs> you have to understand what they're doing in Pakistan. And uh, you have to be much more data-oriented. And so I tried to bring that kind of data-oriented approach to a world that you think is all data-oriented. But in many ways, you know, technology and engineers are brilliant at conceiving of new things and kind of making them happen, basically. And they believe then people will come. And then Steve Ballmer has remained a close friend of yours and really was a... Uh, uh, Consultant and a, and a helper and a and an investor in your next venture, which was, uh, which was Stagwell Group. You leave Microsoft and basically you see a blank sheet of paper in front of you and saying, "What am I going to do now? I've been in traditional polling, research, advertising, both in the firm, in the agency, the big." global conglomerate like WPP. I've been inside managing a $2 billion budget for Microsoft. Now I've, I'm going to create a agency, a new digital first agency from scratch, Stagwell. Looking at that blank sheet of paper, what did you say? What was the first thing you put down on that sheet? Well, you know, I, I viewed the process as climbing a mountain, right? And so uh, <clears throat> I, I had, look, Steve said to me, when, when Steve was outside Microsoft, he said, look, I liked working with you. you. That idea you told me one day, I'll be your core investor. Because I had been thinking for a while about doing this. And, and, then, and then he said yes. So the first thing was get capital. So between me and Steve, we're the, we were the two investors. We, we, uh, I, always, I always joke, it's a larger part of my net worth. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we announced that we had $250 million to invest. Well, OK, great, but now. Like, who the heck am I? We needed deals. So I started with politics with people I knew. And uh, we were in a competitive, in a competition. And we, within three or four months, closed the, the first deal. And I told them how, you know, a couple of years from now, we're going we're gonna to have plenty, I used to call it brothers and sisters, as we build this network around the marketing wheel and as we fill in the digital services. And they looked at me like, yeah, 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 just OK. And uh, <laughs> I think that we then met, we, we've actually done 15 deals in the two years. So I had a concept, right? So I had a concept of the kind of company, the kind of size, the marketplace, and the distribution of the companies. And against those targets, then we built a team of 14 or 15 internally Right, who could manage this? Trying to stay, you know, the first deal was done with just me, and an assistant, uh, and then, and then uh, by the end, you know, two years later, we had 15 people who who help work on the deals, uh, understand and analyze because we get incoming, you know, almost every day now. Then, as the companies came in, they, it had to be really different from the holding companies to really value the talent, really encourage them to continue to grow. 
we had to encourage them to understand how to grow uh, their companies and and at the same time it gets more complex every day so and I'm going to to London now because our first acquisition in London you know in performance marketing I think it's just forward 3d is a, is a terrific company uh, that has a global footprint as we wrap up mark uh, without spoiling the book too much uh, you've identified many of the opposing micro trends that are pushing and pulling on culture society and the world explain the forces behind them and highlighted some of the concerns that we should have about the technology and powers that are driving them. Do we need to learn more about how to function in this brave new chaotic world or does something big need to change that we don't see yet? Well, look, I, I think that it's just a matter of understanding where things need to be tempered. I don't think that we need a fundamental change, of course. I think people are living today with the advantage of modern technology, access to information, the growth of online shopping is, a, is obviously a, a, a mega trend. And, and these are incredible changes. And I think as it, as it moves into some of the areas where AI is properly employed, it will get even, even, even more uh, incredible. So I'm fundamentally optimistic about the core direction. But <clears throat> what happened was whether it was privacy, whether it was ethics, whether it was what was the, the the security, right? The issues and, and whether it was fairness and keeping ourselves democracy. And one of the things I point out, oddly enough, uh, the more money people get, the first thing they seem to get rid of is kids. So there's, there's no population. Rather than being overpopulated, we're, we're in the danger of being underpopulated because people would rather spend money on themselves than on kids. So. It's People love data <laughs> about themselves. You've got a <laughs> chapter love, on it. They, they, they love data uh, about themselves. And, but, but so we really need to take care of the other branch. We need to wake up and say, you know what? we got to just make some mid-course corrections here. We shouldn't be over-optimistic and rush to driverless cars before they're truly ready. We, we should understand how our data is being monetized. We should make sure that the primary and election processes are fair and open. I, I say you've got to get rid of caucuses instead of primaries. Uh, you know, so that they're, they're primaries. Uh, we, we've got to have more codes of ethics and technology in general because I don't think people understand the forces that, that they're unleashing. Uh, and we have to, you know, we have to kind of figure out some of those security issues. So if we do those things and not think that, oh, don't worry about it, we're now far enough along that we have to worry about these things. If we if we do those things, I think we will be able to take advantage of the incredible opportunities that lay ahead. There are ways that we've talked about in this conversation, Mark, about how to focus on what you're thinking about, writing about. Obviously, first, Microtrends Squared, your new book, The New Small Forces Driving Today's Big Disruptions, that you've written with Meredith Feynman. If you look in what you've published this week, New York Times op-ed, How to Make Facebook More Accountable, and Market Watch, What Facebook and Other Tech Leaders Must Do to Win Back Our Trust. If people want to continue to follow Mark Penn, Stagwell, and the thoughts you're having, what's the best way to keep in touch with Penn? Well, uh, just check out our website. Uh, I tend to continue to be active in writing about the current topics, so uh, throw me in your Google alert. It's probably your best. And uh, check out the Stagwell Group. Uh, you know, I'm I'm pretty accessible. You know, it's a, funny. My group says, "Well, everybody's into privacy these days." You know, f frankly, you, you, if you can't figure out my email and so forth, you're you're <laughs> you're uh, uh, you're not technologically up to snuff. Mark, safe travels over to London. Thanks so much for joining us inside the Ice House. Thank you. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Mark Penn author of Microtrends Squared, the new small forces driving today's big disruptions. You can find it at your local independent bookstore or, as we discussed with Mark, myriad technology platforms and online shopping sites. If you like what you heard, you've heard me ask you this before, I'll say it again, please rate us on iTunes so that other folks know where they can find us. And if you've got a comment on this episode or a question, you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at NYSE. Our show is produced by Pete Ash and Ian Wolf with production assistance from Ken Abel and Stephen Portner. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. 
Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties expressed or implied as to the accuracy or completeness of this information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any security or recommendation of any security or trading practice.